14 to offer a biblical perspective on how we overcome those emotions, how we overcome those circumstances. And Jesus is challenging us to abide in the vine. And so in this passage, Jesus told his disciples everything that they needed to know to live a fruitful life. And it's actually pretty simple. He says, stay connected to me. I'm like, thanks, Jesus. How do we do that? Stay connected to me. And actually that oftentimes when, when our lives are not truly abiding in Jesus, for honest, our way doesn't work. Our, it leaves us feeling overwhelmed with, certain, with these emotions or there's no fruit in our life or we're discouraged all the time. And if you remember two weeks ago, Sav talked about our desperate need to stay in the vine. Jesus is the vine, to be in connection with him, to pursue Christ in our everyday life. That us as branches, you're like, what are branches? Jesus refers to us as branches that we're going to look at in a minute. But branches cannot have life apart from Christ, nor can we bear fruit. What is bearing fruit? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Instead, when we live our way, we're often filled up with anger, anxiety, stress, serious fatigue, and just overwhelming exhaustion. And on a lighter note, I don't know if you heard some of those emotions, but out of those, not in more of a spiritual sense, maybe just on a lighter note here, that if there's ever a moment or doing something where I am never overtaken with fatigue... It's one thing, and I'm going to offend some of you. Please forgive me, because I know this is a lot of you. It is during a movie. So, yeah. Some of y'all go to the movies, and you can't even stay awake. I don't know if you consider yourself a big movie person, but I am. And so if you and I were to ever watch a movie together, and you fall asleep, I am deeply offended. Like, I am pouring my heart out to you. How do you not care about this three-hour-long movie? There is a problem. That is just something that I'm like, I've been tired, but I, have, I never fall, I don't want to go as far as never, but I never fall asleep during a movie. That's just me. Like, I am so invested. My wife, Emily, is not this way, and I love her more than anyone in the world. Like, we will sit down at 7 p.m., and I'm like, hey, here it comes up. It's a <clears throat> I'm like, and then, and then I'll turn off the TV. I'm just over it. I'm just over it. I'll just, you know, we'll watch it again at, like, noon tomorrow. I turn it off, she'll wake up, and I'm just like, no, keep it going. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're just going to. It's over, bro. It's, we're, we're not watching a movie tonight. That's okay. Literally, my, one of my favorite movies ever is Interstellar. <laughs> Listen. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> All of Emily had to sit crisscross applesauce on the carpet to watch the three-hour movie. She won't go make it. I said, "Listen, this is this means a lot to me. This movie. I don't know if you've ever done that. If you're a movie person, I know you got your favorite movies. Some of my favorite movies are Interstellar for sure, Batman: The Dark Knight. That's what I'm saying." Also the best superhero in my opinion. I know, I'm going to. Also another one, Inception. Have you seen Inception? Dude, if you just want your mind, just like, if you fall asleep during those, like, you're offending me, okay? I'm a big movie person. Big movie person. And also, I don't know if this is like, if you're making me feel old, but like another great one is the original Karate Kid. Have you seen that one? 1984, where are my 84 people at? It's not me, but <laughs> shout out the, the class of 84. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. <laughs> but in this movie, in the original Karate Kid, there's this scene, if you know what I'm talking about, there's the main character, Daniel, and then there's like the sensei, like Mr. Miyagi, right? He's the karate guy. If you don't know anything, long story short, Daniel is like really needing to like learn karate, karate to protect himself. And like Mr. Miyagi is like, you know, this super like Zen guy, you know. And so he comes across him and they have this big competition coming up. And so Mr. Miyagi, he starts to train Daniel. And in this thing, he's like, all right, you know, I'm going to do this great training. I'm going to be a karate master. And the funny thing is, is that Mr. Miyagi starts training him in ways that actually aren't physical necessarily. I mean, he just starts doing all these things like, what are we, what are we doing? And there's this scene where Daniel walks in to the place, and Mr. Miyagi is sitting here with these little clippers. And he's sitting there, like, trimming this, what they call a bonsai tree. You know what that is? Well, they're super expensive if you get the right one. 
But in story, he's trimming this bonsai tree, and it looks super strange, but a bonsai tree is basically just this tree that you have to, like, trim and cut, and then it, like, creates this cool, beautiful tree. Like, I, I'm not into that, but, like, it could be for you. If y'all are in it, you know, I'm no offense, you know. But if that's you, good for you. And so, and they're doing this, and he's like, Daniel, why don't, why don't you try? And Daniel's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm kind of scared. I think I'm going to mess it up. And he's like, no, 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 just try. And he, and he hands him the clippers, and he hands it to him. And he's like, oh, I don't know what to do. And he says, close your eyes. And so Daniel sits in front of this untrimmed tree, and he closes his eyes. And Mr. Miyagi, I love what he says. He says, just think tree. Thanks, brother. <laughs> like, I, I'm looking at it. I don't got to think about it. So anyway, but he's sitting there, and he's like, just think tree. And he's like, picture what you want it to be. Picture what you want it to be. And so he's sitting there, and there's this moment. And then he's like, okay, I think I kind of see how I want to trim it. And, and the saying it's cool. And then he opens his eyes. And he opens his eyes, and then he starts to trim the tree. He says, what if it's wrong? He's like, no, the vision is in your head. I see it. It's going to be good, okay? So he starts to trim it, and then he starts to do it. And all this is just this awesome scene, and he's teaching Daniel all these things. And so, but I actually want to invite you into watching this clip real briefly. So check out the scene from The Karate Kid. I don't know how to do this stuff. No, 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 sit down. No, no, I may mess it up. I don't want to mess it up or something. Close eye. Trust. Concentrate. Think only to the Make a perfect picture down to rust the pine needle. Wipe your mind clean. Everything. Nothing exists, whole world, only tree. You got it? Open eye. Remember picture? Yeah. Make a like picture. Just to trust the picture. But how do I know if my picture is the right one? If come from inside you, always right one. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's this there's this, this scene. He's like, just just think tree, just think tree. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. If not. That's okay, but as I'm reflecting on this, this movie scene in this, in this Karate Kid movie, um, actually, I believe that this gives us a pretty good glimpse into what Jesus is trying to teach us in John 15. And if you have your Bibles, I'll encourage you to open that up, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 in John 15. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And there's a couple things I want you to see in this passage. Jesus is saying he is the true vine. The father is the gardener. And we are the branches. And specifically when I watch this clip, I think of verses 1 and 2. It says, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You see, in this God is the good gardener in our lives, always pruning. God sees the vision of us that is more like him. God sees beyond what we see. Daniel doesn't understand, but he's saying, just think that far ahead. Think that far ahead. God sees what we can't. And God sees the things that are also keeping us from experiencing the full life that he has for us. Now, I assume, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but none of us are expert, like, vineyard workers, unless that's, like, your side hustle. Like, you know, I, I would assume that. 
But I don't, I don't know if any of you have any experience, and I certainly do not, but I will give you some of my insight into what I've found out through research is that pruning, as what Jesus is speaking about, is when a gardener of a vineyard with grapes is trimming and he's cutting back branches off of the main branch. And the gardener would prune actually the dead wood off the branch so that it would be able to grow in the next season. And so oftentimes in the pruning season, when you would look at it, you'd say, wow, there's a lot cut back. But a, a master gardener will tell you, well, this needs to take place for the next season of harvest so that it will be even more fruitful. And so for the vine and the branch to have full growth, something actually needed to be cut back, which our brains try and wrap around. We're like, I don't understand that. You would only know that if you are familiar with this. And so by doing so, it would produce more fruit. This is the process of pruning. Now, I was doing some research, some more research about this. This completely intrigued me. And do you know when the best time to actually prune these vines are? Probably not, but I'll give you the answer. It is actually in between January-ish and March. And so these are like kind of the colder months in this kind of after season. The gardener would actually call this time the dormant months. The dormant months mean were months where it seems like everything is inactive. Like there's nothing happening. Maybe it even looks dead. There's, there's things that just, it doesn't look like it's producing fruit. It's at rest. It's idle. And we're on the outside, it just looks like nothing seems to be going well. Why? Because the gardener is preparing the branch for the upcoming harvest so that it will produce more fruit. Tonight I wonder, I mean I really wonder, if some of us feel like we too are in the dormant months, the pruning season, the difficult season, where God seems to be cutting back the dead wood in our lives, where he's pruning the areas of our life that are not producing fruit, or maybe you feel God is trying to. And I want you to know this. This is really important. God's pruning is for producing. God's pruning is for producing. I think we can be guilty of thinking that God's pruning is, is God punishing us. We begin the lie, to believe the lie that maybe this is happening because I am getting punished because I did something wrong. Please hear me, you are never punished by God. Do you know where God's punishment actually took place and it was finished? 2,000 years ago, God's punishment and wrath was satisfied on an innocent man, Jesus, for the sake of us, the guilty. That it says that Jesus satisfied the wrath of God for us on the cross. It was all poured out onto his son. That's where punishment was took place, finished, and the wrath of God was satisfied. So pruning is not punishment, but it's redemptive so that you may produce more fruit and be more like Jesus. But this is the reality of this in our life. God's discipline and his pruning can feel heavy, can feel hard, can even bring serious questioning. I don't know if you've ever been in a spot like that. We're like, God, what is happening? Would you consider Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 through 11 with me tonight? It says this, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how. And I just want to pause here for a moment before we read the rest of the passage. Many of us, when we think about our lives and we think about our parents or our father, many of us are familiar with our dads trying to discipline us, care for us, love on us, even when it was hard. When you know you're a child and you're doing something and your dad lovingly is like, hey, that is not what you should be doing. I'm going to bring you over here. Even though you're like, dad, I don't understand. This is hard. And he's like, no, and it hurts us. Trying to be there for us, never leave us. Our father's trying to love on us. And my dad, specifically, always looked out for me. I've been extremely blessed to have uh, my dad. And he always, something I admire about my father is that he would always put me above him, even to this day. 
He's always trying to take care of me. Except this one time. To say, you feel it. This one time, my dad folded. Folded, bro. And I, I listen, my dad folded under pressure. Long story short, love you, dad. This time was not his prime moment, okay? So let me tell you about this time in high school. And I was, it, was, it was in July. And you know July, it's warm. Also, like the best holiday ever, July 4th is around that time. So it's like July 1st. I know, bro. It's like July 1st. And I get this text from my boy. He's like, yo, bro, we're going out bigger than ever this year. I'm kind of scared. Like, I don't know what that means. He's like, I got a guy that has this firework, but, like, it's not really a firework. I don't condone any of this. It's kind of like a firework. And, and, but I, I really, I think we should try it for, you know, the show. I like to put on a show and all this. I think we should do it. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to hurt nobody. We should probably test it. He's like, yeah, but we got to go to this back road at this guy's house. I don't even, I can't even tell you his name. I'm like, dude, I don't want this thing blown up on the drive back. That's a tough place to be. So anyways, we get it. We get this, and I'm like super curious. And we're about, I'm like, okay, we'll just go down the street. We're we'll on the street and, and just light it on the ground. We were, we were in high school. You know, we just light it on the ground. But before we did it, I called my dad. I'm like, yo, dad, like, I don't know what's about to happen, but you kind of got to be here for this. He's like, what is it? I'm like, trust. And so, <laughs> bad move. So anyways, I'm like, but get, but get the van. Bring the van in case it all goes sideways. Like, pick us up, bro. And he's like, all right, you know, dad, he's like, I guess I'll do this for my son. So he's in the minivan a couple blocks down. And I'm like, dad, whatever happens, just you don't leave. We, I, I need you to come through. He's like, yeah. So I open up the van doors, right? So in case something goes crazy, I can hop in and, you know, get out of there. He's like, Tanner, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I got you, bro. Like, none of that's going to happen. And so I'm like, all right, I got you. You don't leave until I get in there. And so I'm walking up there. I'm like, dude, like, I'm kind of scared. And so we get down there, and, and I light this firework, and I, listen, I run like three steps behind this tree, and dude, when I tell you, listen to me, when this shook the inner bowels of my body, and I am, I, it blows up, and I am, I can't see anything. I can't see anything, and none of my boys can see it. I'm running, like, I can't see anything, and my dad, bro, my dad had the audacity <laughs> dry, dude door he went so fast the door shut automatically bro and I'm running dude and I'm like oh no so I busted down the alley and I'm like I don't even know why I'm running my dad's gone I start running down the alley dude I'm sprinting down there and then it's a long like my house was right in front of the alley and I'm running and I'm like oh no my garage door is wide open my mom's standing there like this she heard it she heard it and my dad's like <laughs> I'm like bro I'm like, he's like, he's like, why would you do that? No, he didn't say, but he bailed on me. He bailed on me when he said he wouldn't. Man, we, we talk about it to this day. He said he wouldn't leave me. He'd protect me. Man, but as funny as this is, as funny as it is, I do believe maybe some of us have experienced this on a deeper level. That if we're honest, maybe some of us have a father that maybe always goes against his word. Or maybe a father that was never really around like he should have been. Or maybe every time he says something, he does the complete opposite. Maybe we have serious hurts, serious wounds. Maybe we just can't trust him. I understand that that is the reality for many of us. And it hurts. And I want you to know tonight that that is not our heavenly father. It is not our heavenly father. Our Heavenly Father is filled with love and compassion. He deserves all of our trust because when we tr even treated him poorly, he treated us richly. Look at verse 10. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. God's pruning, God's discipline in our lives, the things he is cutting out of our life is always good for us and it's never punishment. It says so that we might share in God's holiness. In other words, that we will be more like him, that we will be deeper into his loving heart. And I can't think of any greater intimacy in this world than being in the heart of the creator of the universe in a loving, perfect relationship, bringing us deeper into his heart. Isn't that what you've always longed for? An intimate, loving relationship. 
Isn't that what our hearts yearn for? Someone to see us at our best and our worst and say, I love you and I've chosen you. That is our God. He's always good. But the reality and the truth is tonight that even if we trust what God is removing in our life or we feel him saying, hey, you know I've been trying to remove that. Even if we believe it's good, that doesn't always mean we let him because it's difficult, because it isn't necessarily enjoyable. It often hurts. It isn't easy. It causes change in our life, and we are creatures of habit, and we don't like change. And sometimes we choose our way and not his. And for the past two weeks, we've been revealing how our way, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I believe, guys, and I say this with love, what we refuse to let God prune in our life often reveals what has taken his place. What we refuse to let God remove and prune in our life reveals what has taken his place. We, I believe so often, think about this with me, In our hearts, we say, God, do whatever you want. Trim anything you want in my life except for that thing. God, remove anything in me that does not honor you, anything that is leaving me dry and isolated and filled with guilt. Remove it, but not that, because I like it too much. God, would you give me all of your blessings, but I don't want to give you my obedience. We know that God doesn't want those things in our life, and we continue to choose it, and it leaves us empty, and our way doesn't work. And I believe God through his Holy Spirit is saying, I am trying to remove that from your life, not for punishment, but for purpose, to produce more fruit. Verse 11 goes on to say, it's painful. It's painful. But afterward, there will be here to, don't don't, don't miss this, there will be a peaceful harvest. A peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. It says if we allow the pruning, there is peace on the other side. Are you fighting to find peace and satisfaction in your own way tonight? Have you been trying your way so long that you're saying there's got to be something else and God is saying, allow my pruning in your life, abide in me, and it is there. Not that your life is perfect, but there's peace in the imperfection. Do you see it? So it's a peaceful harvest, peaceful fruit. Is there one thing you know is not giving you that peace, patience, kindness, joy, but it's robbing it. Tonight, I don't know. I don't know what God is pruning in your life or what he's speaking to you tonight. I, don't, I believe our God is good and I believe, he, I believe he does a lot of things in our life and he speaks to us in a variety of different ways. And I got this little tree here. Maybe for some of you, you know deep in your heart that that thing God is trying to prune in your life is that dating relationship because it doesn't honor the Lord. And you know that it's robbing you of your peace, of your patience, of your joy. Maybe for others, it's letting go of the substance that you continuously run to because you know that you don't want to face the reality of our life and God is saying I have more for you we run to substances to fill us and it leaves us empty and God is saying I'm pruning that out of your life maybe it's a friend group that is dragging you down the wrong path and it's not that they're just bad people but you know that every time you're with them you do something that you wish you didn't maybe it's an addiction 
Maybe that addiction in your life, you're saying, oh, God, I am so tired of this. I want to stop. And he's saying, would you allow my Holy Spirit to work in your life? Or maybe it's just something a little bit more internal. Maybe in our hearts, we're filled with pride where it has to be our way. I am the only one right. And that conversation I had with my friend, I am right, they are wrong, so I will ignore them. And God is saying, I'm pruning the pride out of your life. Would you let me? Maybe it's our accomplishments. God is saying, you're putting your identity and your achievements at school or at, in a sport. And he's saying, that doesn't change how I view you. And he's saying, would you let me prune that out of your life and run and abide in my heart? Maybe it's a grudge. You've been carrying the weight of unforgiveness in your heart for some time. And you're saying, God, I will submit to you. I will choose you. But I'm not forgiving them. And God is saying, would you enter into the process of forgiveness with me? Would you let me prune the grudge out of your life? Because God sees this. He sees he sees who he is trying to make you to be into a beautiful picture that produces more fruit, that is filled with joy and with peace. So tonight, what do we do? What do we do? And I would tell you, we not only embrace God's pruning, but we ask for his pruning. We say, God, would you prune the areas of my life that you see is sucking out my energy? When you go home, when we go to school, we ask God to reveal where he wants to make us more like him. Are you bold enough and willing enough to say, God, I, I need your pruning work on my life not just to bear fruit, to, to bear more. I want to be more in your heart. I want to be more like you. I want to know you more. Would you satisfy me, Lord? I believe he's speaking to us tonight. Being the branch means learning not to resist his pruning work in our life so that we can fully experience the beautiful and fruitful life he envisions for us. And like I said earlier, it's not punishment that was satisfied on the cross, it's purpose. It's purpose. As I mentioned earlier, the gardeners in Stanyard Vineyard Care would often prune in the months where it's cold, where it's after harvest, it's after season. And it seems like it's dead. It seems like there's nothing going on. And I want to show you a vine right after it's pruned. Here's a photo of this. This is right after it was pruned. It's in the cold months. And on the outside, if I'm honest, it doesn't look great. And when I look at this, I can't help it. But when I look at this branch pruned clean of all ex excess, it stands like a cross, arms outstretched and bare, giving the appearance of death, but we know it is on the brink of life. It is not dead. And it's the death that brings forth greater life, greater fruit. Without death, there can be no resurrection. And Christ, who bore the cross, taking on total death for you and I, completely cut, completely beaten down, completely embracing all that the Father has for him so that you can experience full life. He bore the punishment and the wrath of God on the cross and satisfied it so that we get the blessing of pruning in our life. So we have eternal life with the Father who loves us and wants to share in his holiness. What an honor. So that we could have greater life. Christ died on that tree for you and for me. 
no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, no matter how filled your tree is, he says, I took it. The question tonight, will you too not only embrace, but ask for the good, merciful, and loving pruning of God in your hearts? Father in heaven, Thank you for all that you're doing tonight, God. Thank you for the ways that you just so graciously reveal things to us. God, thank you that you don't punish us, Lord, that that was satisfied, that we get to enter into eternal life with you, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that you bore death so that we may receive life. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to pray the prayer that you would prune us, that we would embrace that. Lord, that we would see the greater picture that you see that we don't. God, would we go from this place changed more like you? Thank you for being our loving and good father. Let us abide and place you first. We love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen.